You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Fiona Davis. It's episode 237 of the Author Stories Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. You know, you can find all of the archives of the show over at HankGarner.com. And when you're over there, there's some links in the right-hand sidebar where you can subscribe to the show and never miss an episode. I hope you're enjoying all of these extra bonus episodes we've got for you. It's a packed month. And... Uh, I'd like to thank our sponsors for making that happen. Because of our great sponsors, we're able to keep bringing you excellent content uh, each and every week. Thanks to C. Stephen Manley and his book series, Awakened, the Paragons Trilogy Book One. A powerful cult and apocalyptic ritual, two mythical heroes are about to wake up. Israel and Aaron are strangers with a common bond. Not only did they just wake up in an unfamiliar warehouse with no memories of how they got there, but they're also the next potential victims for a pack of hideous mutants, at least until a covert organization saves their lives and takes them to meet an eccentric billionaire. This book series is so much fun. The Paragons Trilogy, Awakened, is book one. Go pick them up today. Also, thanks to Daniel Arthur Smith and Tales from the Canyons of the Damned, my favorite monthly publication, Canyons, always brings you pulpy goodness each and every month it's the halloween episode you've got to go pick it up tales from the canyons of the damned also thanks to bob williams and his books music city macabre and arch city apocalypse he uh combined them into one volume called blood and chaos you're gonna love it music city will never be the same again also nick breaker and paul e hicks galactic satori chronicles book one earth and book two Kron. some of the best science fiction you'll ever read go pick them up today authors you know you need a website and readers if you would like to connect with your favorite authors go to thirdscribe.com rob and the folks there have built an amazing community to help you find the books that you want and connect with the writers and the readers uh, that you're looking for go visit them today at thirdscribe.com Peter Cadron's new book, Retrograde, is amazing. The international team at the Mars Endeavor Colony is prepared for every eventuality except one. What happens when disaster strikes Earth? Think uh, The Martian and kind of a post-apocalyptic setting. You're going to love this book. I uh, couldn't put it down when I got my copy of it. Retrograde by Peter Cardron. Also, my good friends at Keystroke Medium, Josh Hayes, Scott Moon, and Ralph Kern uh, have some of the best live YouTube shows for writers. Go visit them at keystrokemedium.com and subscribe to their YouTube channel. They do a live show every Monday. I've been on it. It's so much fun. Go check it out. If you're looking for military sci-fi, let me tell you about a series that I love. It's by Richard Fox, and uh, Richard won the Dragon Award for Best Military Sci-Fi this year. And the reason is he does military sci-fi like no one else. It is the best that you're going to read. The Ember War Saga is a nine-book series. You know, if you're like me, I don't like to get into a new series until some substance to it. There's nothing worse than getting involved in a book series and then you're waiting for the author to catch up. Well, there's nine books in the Ember War Saga, some of the best military sci-fi that you're going to find. Go check it out today by Richard Fox. Stay tuned after the show for an audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I have a show to bring you that I've been super excited to record for quite a while. Fiona Davis is my guest today, and her brand new book is called The Address. Uh, you might know her previous book, The Dollhouse, uh, which was uh, a magnificent book as well. Uh, when I posted on on Facebook uh, that I was going to interview uh, you, a lot of people went nuts. They were like, oh, I love The Dollhouse house it was such a wonderful book so uh anyway welcome to the show fiona oh that's great to hear thank you i'm, I'm thrilled to be here sure um i begin each show with the same question and that question is what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or a storyteller you know my answer might be different from most of your guests i really hadn't thought about it i i came to new york as an actress 
Um, you know, I couldn't imagine writing a book. That seemed utterly impossible. And um, after about 10 years of acting, I, I went to graduate school for journalism. So I was writing stories, but they were nonfiction. And so they involved interviews and research and a narrative, but I certainly wasn't making anything up. <laughs> sure. And, um, and so I, I was a journalist for a long time after that. And it was only when I found a story that I really wanted to make into an article, which was about this group of women who lived in the Barbizon Hotel and stayed on after it became a condo. And, you know, so they were grandfathered into these rent control departments as the building was made into luxury condos. And I thought, what an interesting contrast. And I'd love to write an article and interview them about what they've seen and how things have changed. But I couldn't get them to give me an interview. And at the same time, I couldn't shake this idea that this was a good story. And only then did I realize, hey, I could write a book and make stuff up here, but <laughs> use the structure of reality to frame it. And so really, that's where it came from, just out of a need to, to talk about you know, what might have happened at this building in the 50s and today. You know, I, I modified that question. I used to say, what was your first memory of wanting to be a writer? And I added, or storyteller, uh, after having a couple of conversations uh, with my friend Craig Johnson, who writes the Longmire mysteries that, uh, yes. you know, that the TV show is based on. And he said, you know, we... We have these really uh, long-lasting and strong traditions, uh, like in, in the cowboy culture, for instance, of, you know, being out, working on fences, and, and you're camping, you know, night after night, and you're sitting around the fire, and, and we tell stories. And it's the thing that uh, keeps our heritage alive. It keeps uh, us entertained while we're away from home, and, and uh, you know, it's the thing that makes us human. And I started thinking about that a lot, and, and I believe that we are born storytellers, uh, yet writing is something that we grow into, uh, maybe hone the craft, uh, that sort of thing. But there's something innately human uh, about telling stories and wanting to understand and communicate the things that we see that are happening behind the things. And I, I love that story about the seeing the architecture and, and knowing that there's something there that needs to be communicated. Yes, and I, I love that idea of, of sitting around a campfire. I, I do. I think it's our way of making sense of the world right. is to tell a story. And, you know, when I was an actress and was acting in Shakespeare um, plays, it was all retelling of stories um, that had existed long before Shakespeare's time. And he felt the need to, you know, transform them into plays and, and keep that 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 narrative going about what are the themes here and how did people overcome these struggles? So it's, it's, you're right. It's just long, long lasting. <laughs> right. Uh, there's also a strong connection, especially with guests uh, on the show uh, of uh, writers and actors that, uh, that the lines tend to blur in a lot of situations. Uh, what was it that intrigued you about uh, acting uh, originally? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, you know, I think I was very shy as a, as a kid. And so being on stage and having lines to say made me feel free because I didn't have to be myself. I could be someone else. And so it really came out of this inherent shyness, which doesn't really make sense. You think of actors as, you know, brash and, and outgoing, but that wasn't true for me. <laughs> Well, I kind of giggled when you said that because I know exactly what you mean, that there's uh, you know, so many actors uh, are really kind of introverts that and, and it's such a, a bizarre twist of fate that uh, that being in front of a group of people with a spotlight on you is where you can let your defenses down and and actually, you know, bear yourself. It's it's really crazy, the, uh, but it's absolutely true in a lot of cases. Yeah, and so in the book, in The Dollhouse, the first book, I have the character Darby, who's very shy, um, go on stage and have to sing. And I think that was my way of, of recreating that feeling of where you step out into the spotlight and, you know, against everything that your body's telling you to do, you go out and try to entertain someone. Yeah. So um, you, you pursued acting uh, professionally, didn't you? 
Yes, I did. I acted for about 10 years here in New York doing Broadway, off-Broadway, regional theater, that kind of thing. Now, what were some of the challenges? Uh, and what, well, first off, uh, did you move to New York? Were you already living there when you decided to, to, uh, you know, to, to try your hand as a professional actor? No, I wasn't. You know, I, I graduated from college in Virginia and had some friends up here and thought, hey, I'll, I'll come on up and join them. And um, ended up going to a two-year acting program and, and, you know, headed out from there. Um, so it was a kind of a bold step to come to New York, but I, I'm so glad I did. Yeah. Uh, what did you do in the meantime while you were pursuing acting? And, uh, you know, we, we hear stories of, you know, people that are wide eyed and, you know, I'm going to chase this dream. And then you land in the big city and you and you realize, oh, my goodness, there are 12 million other people here <laughs> and they all want to do the same thing. <laughs> oh, it's so true. And and I worked as a, a secretary and as a waiter. Um, and, and luckily I got in with a wonderful theater company and they're still my good friends today. Um, and we, we put on shows and, you know, we moved them from off Broadway to Broadway. We got nominated for a Tony. We, we just created our own world to live in. And it was led by some terrific actors and an amazing director. And, um, and that's really where I found my home because it was a family um, of actors and creative people that just was enthralling. Um, did you also say that you worked in journalism as well? Yes, I did. So um, I went off to Columbia Journalism School to get a master's um, and loved, loved that. It was nice to have a little more control over my fate because as an actor, you're, you know, you, you have to go where, go where you're hired. Sure. Um, and so, yeah, and so I started doing um, some journalism, health, fitness, women's issues, that kind of thing, writing for women's magazines. If you needed an article on heartburn, I was your gal. <laughs> um, and so, uh, so that, that kind of thing, and, and did that for a while and, and really enjoyed that as well. Did you feel comfortable uh, within the confines of that? Like, a, so an editor says, I need, you know, a, uh, a 2,000 word uh, story about heartburn, you know, and so you, you sit down and you're like, okay, I, I need to fill 2000 words. These are some sources. These are, uh, you know, and did you feel comfortable in those confines? Oh, I loved it. I loved it because, you know, there, there's, uh, there's a process. Um, you do your research, you read everything you can on the subject, you find good sources, you interview them, you create an outline and you write it and then you edit it and then you edit it again. Um, and so I used that exact same process when I decided to try to write a work of fiction, even though instead of 2,000 words, it was 90,000. Um, but the process stayed true and, and really helped me uh, figure, figure out a way in on a, a, just a, a, a subject that I'd never really thought about conquering before. Sure, sure. Um, you know, I've, I've talked to several people that have, uh, that have had – um, careers in journalism. And, you know, at first you think, well, it's not the same as writing fiction. It's uh it's a completely different skill set. But, but when you really start peeling the layers back, there are a lot of overlapping skills uh, because you can, a, a good journalist doesn't just give you a, uh, a bullet pointed list of things that happened or uh, steps to take. You know, if it's that sort of article, you really need to construct a narrative that, that pulls the reader in and uh, and the, the journalist's job is to find the things uh, that are not obvious to everyone and, and to point out the highlights that make uh, the story more than just the story everybody else sees. Uh, do you agree with that? I absolutely agree. And one of the best classes I, I actually audited it at Columbia because I couldn't get in um, was a class by James Stewart, who is a fantastic long form writer um, and, and he really showed how it's the devil is in the details and you can write a story about say a flood that went on in a Midwestern town and, and make the reader feel like they're there. So journalism doesn't need to be dry and, and stayed. It can be so interesting. And, you know, writers like Marie Brenner, who writes for Vanity Fair, just create this can, can take a really complex subject and create 
a world out of it that you feel like you're you're right in there and invested in. And so I agree. I think it's a an amazing and, and a challenging form. Sure, sure. So you you alluded to it a little bit ago about that uh, that situation that really informed uh, your first book. And tell us a little bit about how that uh, that building and the architecture uh, really brought the story of the dollhouse alive to you. Yeah, so the Barbizon, um, it's at Lexington and 63rd, and it's this unusual building for that area. It's got these Moorish arches at the top. Um, it's Art Deco, really, um, really interesting. And it just had this really storied history where people like Sylvia Plath um, stayed there, Grace Kelly, Lauren Bacall, Joan Didion stayed there, Eudora Welty. It had this incredible history as a woman's hotel and a place of refuge for young women who were coming to New York um, to kind of, you know, forge their, their careers. And, um, and so then later it became a condo and you had this, you know, you know, you'd have someone living in the $17 million penthouse as well as these ladies on the fourth floor who had lived there for decades and, you know, had kitchenettes and, and smaller apartments. Um, and so I was just intrigued by that mix of old and new. I imagined what it was like someone coming there in the 50s um, to work in New York City and create a career for herself. And, and so it really was, the book became about the themes of women's roles, um, career versus family, that kind of thing, and, um, and kind of took off from there. And really, it was from a microcosm of, of what was going on in the building that that captured my imagination. Um, you had this really great, a great quote on your website. Uh, I saw it a day or two ago, and I, I tried to find it right before we started recording, and, and, and I uh, kind of lost it. Um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm going to butcher it, but I hope to get the spirit of the quote um, uh, uh, across, is that uh, music is uh, liquid architecture, and architecture is... Uh, frozen music. I think exactly. it was. Exactly. Yeah, it's a quote by Goethe. <laughs> yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And that really resonated uh, with me when I read that. And, uh, you know, I, I talk a lot about uh, place and how place affects our storytelling and our writing. Uh, and when done really well, and when you can tell that the author is really immersed in uh, and and really informed by their sense of place, that, that it almost, the setting becomes a character of its very own. And uh, that I love that quote because sometimes uh, it's a, uh, it's a, a rural setting and it's the topography and the, and the people that live there and how they interact with the land uh, that becomes the sense of place that informs it. But sometimes it's this great architecture that's a little weird. And <laughs> it, uh, it, when you look at it, it reminds you of, uh, you know, a golden era or, you know, all of these emotions come attached to it. Uh, and in reading your work, uh, that is very evident to me that the, um, the, the architecture and the places that you've chosen uh, really are a character in the story. Yes. Yeah. That's what I'm, what, that's what I'm going for. And so for the second book, it's the Dakota, which is this gilded age. Some would call it a monstrosity. Some would say it's beautiful. <laughs> um, and it's this, this huge apartment building right on the edge of Central Park. And, um, and I was really inspired by it because it had a long and interesting history, including, of course, the fact that John Lennon was murdered um, outside of it on, in 1980. Um, but even, you know, before then, just the building of it when there was nothing around but pigsties and um, rocks, basically. And the idea that this, the owner decided to build this huge, grand apartment house where he did and took a big risk, um, I thought, well, that's a, a great scenario to start out a book and to set it in 1984 during the Gilded Age and, and capture some of what it was like back then. And then again, to set another time period in 1980, when the building was covered in soot, and the Upper West Side was completely built up, but crime-ridden and dangerous, and 
and and how those two decades compare to each other um, in the the in terms of the building and the entire city around it. When you're dealing with uh, with places that are real, uh, and and these are, are two buildings that uh, that you can go right now and go see and uh, interact with, uh, yet you've built this whole uh, mythology around these places with these characters and the things that happen there. Uh, what are the challenges in uh, taking real? Uh, places and and weaving them with fiction and with stories that may or may not be true or <laughs> stories that are made up but they're informed by real things uh, what are some of the challenges as a writer in doing that it is starting out it was terrifying because as a journalist you don't make things up and and so to have that freedom was kind of terrifying um, but what I'd like to do is really research and take a lot of time digging into what really happened and when it happened. Um, and so, so the framework of, of the time periods are true and hold up and then have imaginary characters that are perhaps influenced by older characters. For example, I read that the Dakota in the 1930s had a woman who ran it who was called the Lady Managerette. And the term was so odd that I thought, well, that's fascinating. And what if we have her, but set her back in 1884 when it first opened? And and so suddenly you have a character. Um, but it is based on, you know, something that happened. But then having the freedom to let the characters wander around the set, you know, if, as if it were a theater, and tell their stories and interact um, is is a lot of the fun and and also a huge a huge challenge. And at the end of each book, I make sure there's an author's note or something that explains kind of what's true and what's not. And if I did have to finagle something that was historically true, I'll mention that and say, "Hey, here's what I did." Um, because I think readers want to know, and at the end of the book, they want to go Google and find out, wait a minute, did that person exist or did they not? <laughs> and and that's kind of half the fun is setting them on a journey of their own. Right. Uh, you know, one of the um, the things that we like to do is we like to romanticize the past and think that things were always better uh, in the past and that people – uh, you know, went about their lives with a certain integrity and, uh, you know, we, we think that, that people were better, uh, <laughs> back yes. then for, for whatever reason. Um, <laughs> you are not afraid to not do that. Uh, you know, when, you know, uh, that's one thing that I love is that your, your characters, uh, and, and I want to talk about your dual timelines, uh, in just a minute, uh, because it's a really clever thing that you do. Uh, but, you know, you're not afraid to have your your characters a hundred years ago. They're just as rich and just as human uh, as you know your modern characters, and they they have their own set of issues and foibles and uh, you know and and good and bad aspects, just like humans are. Uh, was that ever you know an issue with with portraying characters in two different time periods and making sure that you uh, you know portray them correctly for the time period but not giving them too much credit? <laughs> That's great. Um, yeah, you know it, it's it's a little tricky in the you know the 1880s. There's this my character Sarah Smythe um, falls on kind of hard times. Um, you might say, and and has to make some difficult decisions that were even more difficult because of the time period she was in, and and so it it, it was hard. One of the things I I really enjoyed doing in that book was having a setting that was a true setting. It was called Blackwell's Asylum on Blackwell's Island, which is now Roosevelt Island, right off of Manhattan. And I, in my research, I'd read about this harrowing, harrowing treatment of the mentally ill that went on in the 1880s. When, and you think of the Gilded Age and you think of mansions and, and ballrooms, but there was this awful, awful treatment of an entire subset of society back then. And I couldn't help but want to include that in the book as a way to show exactly what you're talking about, that no, it wasn't all 
you know, silk gowns and, um, and, and horse-drawn carriages. Um, and, and that was really what it was like. That was taken from an account by a journalist who went undercover and wrote about what was going on. Or sometimes when it was silk gowns and uh, horse-drawn carriages, they were masquerading something deeper and sometimes more sinister. Yes. Yeah, that the, the character um, can be, you know, covered up by, by beautiful clothes and, and wealth and social standing, but what is their character really deep right. down? Um, the... Uh, the new book, The Address, uh, you've got these, these two timelines. You've got the 1880s and the, uh, and the 1980s. And you are, it's, it's really interesting because the viewpoint goes back and forth between the two. Um, what, what is it about, uh, about that varying viewpoint and, and highlighting the two different times? What is it about that that, that intrigues you? Yeah, you know, as I was starting to, think about the book, I thought, all right, what two time periods would work? And 1884 made a lot of sense because that's when the Dakota first opened. And so there's a lot of inherent drama right there. Um, And then 1980 for me was interesting because in the city you had all these bankers and their Rolex watches and it was a gilded age of its own in many ways. Um, It was right around the time when I first came to the city. So that was great because I could pull on, you know, first person accounts of, of what it was like back then. Um, but most importantly, the reason I chose 1985 was that it was five years after John Lennon's death. And I didn't, I knew I had to mention it and touch upon it because it was a major seminal event in the building's history. But I really didn't want to linger there. And it turns out that Strawberry Fields was dedicated in 1985. So I could kind of incorporate it that way um, in a way that I hope is respectful. Uh, But what about the alternating narrative structure of having two different stories uh, set beside each other? They're, they're the same place, uh, but you know, roughly a hundred years apart. Uh, What, what was it? What is it about the, the two different parallel stories? uh, If you will, it's almost, it's almost a time travel novel without, having to use time travel. <laughs> yeah, you know, I I love mysteries and I really loved reading Agatha Christie and Nancy Drew. And so I liked the idea of having these two different time periods because A, then I don't get bored, right? I'm I'm constantly having to, you know, switch over. Okay, wait, what time period are we in? And to me that's challenging. Um and at the same time, as long as they're linked by a mystery element My hope is that it keeps the reader going. It keeps them moving forward to find out what exactly happened a hundred years earlier and, and how does that affect the characters four generations later? And what are those ramifications between those two time periods that are really pretty far apart, um, but are just as similar as they are different. Um, And so to me, it's, it's just a, a fun writer's challenge to, see if I can pull it off. Um, and, and also, you know, for me, it's a, I love to step back in time. And, and so to be able to do that um, is, is just a real joy. Um, when you first had that idea for The Dollhouse and uh, decided that you wanted to tackle this as a novel, uh, how long did it take you to uh, kind of form the idea and realize, okay, this is a novel and this is something that I'm going to do? And then, then how did you go about, you'd never written a novel before, so what was the process like for you in sitting down and saying, okay, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell this story, I'm not really sure how, but here, here goes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you know, it, it was crazy. What, the first thing I did was I kicked into journalist mode and I found women who'd lived at the Barbizon in the 50s and 60s and I, I'd reach out and interview them. Um, and I just heard these amazing stories and descriptions and, you know, there was one that talked about how there's a lot of talk of ghosts and suicides and, um, you know, the the a woman whose husband used to work in the building would mention that, Every so often, one of the guests would throw herself off a balcony, and they'd cover it up in the press. And, and so there was all this weird tragedy 
among these women wearing their their pearls and white gloves and and so things started to just strike at me as to ooh, that okay that would be an interesting plot point that would be an interesting character and the more information i gathered um the more i thought you know maybe i can pull this off and and then it was a lot of time i outlined it all first with the alternating timelines making sure that they it would work and weaving them together um and then you know wrote a first draft pretty quickly started editing it found an agent and then really that's where i really learned the hard work um was working with her to get it into shape to go out to publishers and and i learned a lot it was it was a, an exhilarating experience yeah i bet um so so you worked from an outline to begin with so you had a a good firm understanding of the story before you uh, kind of sat down and started putting flesh and 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 muscle onto the skeleton that you'd built yes absolutely i i have friends who are writers who can sit down and they just see where it goes each day and i couldn't possibly do it and especially because there's a mystery and you need to drop red herrings and there have to be clues I really map it out pretty carefully. It changes as I go along, right. but I work off a synopsis that says, all right, chapter two, here's what's going to happen. Chapter three, here's the point of view. Here's what's going to happen. Um, it, it can change pretty drastically, but that at least keeps me going. And I'm one of those people who loves to cross things off sure, lists. Sure. <laughs> and so, so that keeps me going because I want to see if I can pull it off and see if I can get through each chapter and there's chapters that I can't wait to write. And so I just kick in and, and keep on going. And, um, that process works for me, although I'm in awe of people who can, you know, just work off the top of their heads. That's amazing. Yeah. And, and, uh, your friends who can just, uh, visualize the story each day and, and, and write a scene or whatever. I, I think a lot of those type people that are, that are wired that way, you know, look at outlining and they say, well, if you do that, you're going to kill the creativity of the story. Um, but with, with books like yours, um, I, it would seem so random to just sit down and, and write those scenes <laughs> off the top of your head. You really need to know where you're going. And, uh, you know, I, did you ever feel like that you're, that you were, uh, okay, I, I've written this book before I ever wrote it. You know, the, like the, like there was nothing exciting about it before the actual writing. Did you ever get to that point? No, no, because, you know, it'll, it, my synopsis, I'd say each chapter has maybe four sentences gotcha. in it. It's really vague. Um, but it, it, it is just a step-by-step -step process. And, and so, you know, there's entire scenes that need to be created and characters that need to be added and, and then something will trigger something and I'll need to make a couple changes. So it, it is, it's a very free flowing form, but I need those four sentences to make sure I'm pointing in the right direction. Gotcha. Makes perfect sense. Makes perfect sense. Um, <laughs> what were the, so you, you worked with the, uh, with the agent and you really whipped the book into shape. Uh, was there anything that surprised you about that part of the process? Um, maybe advice that your uh, agent gave you or, uh, did you ever feel like, uh, wow, I really thought this book was finished until you came along and, you know, told me that I needed to <laughs> rewrite the book. Like, did you ever have that sort of experience? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And and keep in mind, I love being edited. As a journalist, it only makes your writing better. And you need to have someone else's point of view because you can't see it. You can't see the forest for the trees as you're working on a, a massive manuscript. Um, and so, yeah, you know, for me it was learning things like deep point of view, how to express that because it's not, that's not something you do in journalism. Um, and so really getting into a character's head and, and letting their thoughts come out on the page. That to me was a big challenge early on. And, and I'm learning every book, every book. I, you know, hope the, the writing's getting deeper and, uh, and more complex um, but, but it's, it's a really fun thing to do for a living. I have to say, sure. um, after, after the dollhouse came out and it was very well received, uh, when did you start thinking about writing the second book? You know, right pretty soon after I, it, probably the final edits were done in 
January and it was to be released in August. And that's a long time to, to sit around. And I wanted to keep the ball, ball rolling. And so I really started researching as soon as February um, for the next book, for the Dakota book. And, um, and, and it was a little terrifying at first as I was thinking, I can't do this again. You know, how, how did I do this? How did it work? And especially the more praise the dollhouse got, the more um, worried I got about living up to that. <laughs> um, but I'm so glad I, I started writing the second book before the first one was published because as I was going through all those things of getting reviews and, and really jumping into this world of being a published author, working on a manuscript keeps your feet on the ground because it's a humbling experience. And, um, and so it was a, a good contrast um, to, to go back and forth between, you know, doing a really fun interview and then slogging through another chapter of, of the new book. <laughs> <laughs> what is the, the harder part of being a writer? Is it the writing or is it the, uh, the, the publicity and the, the business uh, side of writing? Do, are those things in conflict with you ever? And, uh, you know, is it easy to switch hats back and forth? I find um, the interviews and the author talks and going to libraries and bookstores, I love it. Uh, the first one I was terrified, but then, I don't know, my old acting training kicked in and I, I just love it. I just did one last night and, and it's just so much fun to answer people's questions and hear their point of view and meet people who lived at the Barbizon and read the book. And um, so to me, that's really, really stimulating and it's a really good contrast for me to the the solitude of of writing a book. And you know, I work from home and to me the toughest part is writing that first draft of having a blank page, knowing where I want to go but knowing I have to get those words on that page. Um and that's where I get exhausted. Um and 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 so I find if I have to run out and do an author talk, I I get some energy back and then I can go back in and dive in again. Are, are there any, um, any tricks that you've learned or any little, uh, you know, life hacks, if you will, to, <laughs> uh, to staying motivated as a writer? Uh, because w when you, when you're in promotion mode and when you're doing all the other stuff besides writing, it's very easy to let that stuff take up everything and there's no no time for writing uh and it's very easy to to get to get kind of lopsided like that um is there anything that you do do, do you maintain a a daily writing schedule uh, do you hold you know times and places as sacred that these are just for my writing or are there any things like that that you do i'm you know i'm pretty flexible but when i'm writing that first draft i have a word count that i have to hit each day and i i just feel miserable until i hit it yeah um, I feel guilty. I feel, you know, and I'll do anything to avoid sitting down and, and writing. Um, but I feel so good when it's done and, and suddenly you're, you're energized by what you've written and, oh, how will it play out later in the book? And so the law, it's a, it's a matter of keeping that long-term goal in your head and knowing that you just have to chip away at it one day, one word, one page at a time. And I think what really helped me was when I was young, I trained as a classical pianist. And um, and so every day I practiced for either a half hour to an hour. And, um, and it just was a given. And so I saw over the course of six years how you get better. Um, and I just learned to, all right, you just have to sit down and do it. And so I think that helps is to take away um, – the, the worry that, oh, it's not good enough, because you can always go back and, and revise. And um, as a journalist, you know, if I didn't write the article, I didn't get paid. Right. And that is a very good incentive. Sure, sure. <laughs> um, your, your books are fiction, and obviously uh, I'm sure you hope that readers are entertained uh, when they read the books and that they've had a good experience and, you know, um, and that it's uh, enjoyable for them. Uh, but is there anything that you hope that readers take away from your books other than, you know, I've had a great time uh, kind of losing myself in this place and time period? Sure. I hope 
people reading it will really think about how women's voices have changed over time and how the opportunities for women have changed over time for the the better and and the worse and you know that to me is the most interesting part of it is seeing all right how was mental illness treated in the 1880s and how does that compare to you know someone struggling with addiction in 1980 and and to me that is um a, a really interesting facet to bring about it's about women's roles women as you know having families versus career I, and I hope those themes will resonate with women of all ages who read the book and, and either recognize what their life was like or what their life is like now. Uh, Fiona, the, the new book is entitled The Address, a novel. Uh, and uh, your first book was The Dollhouse. I'm, I'm holding in my hand a copy of The Address. It's absolutely gorgeous. And when I first <laughs> opened it, the very first sentence, uh, I was hooked. And I, I, uh, I've immensely uh, enjoyed reading this book. Uh, where can people find you online if they want to follow along with your work? Sure. Um, FionaDavis.net is my website. I'm Fiona Davis author on Facebook and Fiona J. Davis on Twitter and Instagram. And it's, it's wonderful to hear some from readers. I um, please reach out and, and let me know what you think. For sure. Um, you said when you finished the dollhouse that you uh, took a short break and started on the address. So now that the address is out, uh, what are you working on these days? Yeah, I'm working on a novel that's set at grand central. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I've learned some really interesting things about the building that are, uh, dramatic and powerful and fascinating and that most people don't know. And so it's really fun to explore this, this world. And I've made several trips, you know, I, I'm in New York, so it's easy enough, but I, every time I walk into Grand Central Terminal, I am astounded by the building and its history. And I'm hoping to uh, convey some of that in the next book. I love it. Uh, well, please, Fiona, when that book comes out, uh, come back and visit us again. I'd love to have you. Oh, I'd love to. That would be my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for taking time to come on the show, Fiona. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to HankGarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Tune in for new episodes every Tuesday and Friday. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. His body broke free of its paralysis and he stumbled forward, losing his balance. He fell down the slope towards the spot where they had been. His hand shot out unthinkingly and he grabbed the corner of the black stone bridge. Hoofbeats. Pounding hoofbeats. Coming closer. Coming up the road. Someone or something galloped towards him. The head of an emaciated horse burst from the gloom of the road. The rider was fumbling, out of control, without saddle or bridle, clutching at the white mane, kicking the beast across the hindquarters with his thin legs, his face a frozen mask of terror. He whipped around to look back over his shoulder. Something chased him. Something terrible. Jason spun away as the horse ran over him, spearing him through the chest with its iron-shod hooves. He was unhurt. The horse galloped upward and across the bridge, across strong timbers rough-hewn and not hold. The rider wheeled the horse about, looking back from the far shore. He was wheezing. A sloppy, white ruffle bobbed under his chin. His face was hopeful now. A familiar face, much like the one Jason saw every morning in the mirror. Something thundered up behind Jason, not with a clatter of hoofbeats, but with the teeth-rattling thunder of stone on stone. Ichabod, yes, of course, the man was Ichabod, wailed and the sound of his terror echoed across the valley. The hot breath of a horse burned the back of Jason's neck. He stood frozen, unable to turn his head to see the thing behind him. He didn't want to. This was no ordinary vision. He felt with certainty that the rider behind him, no, the horseman behind him, knew he was there. Ichabod kicked his horse. It reared, brayed, and would have thrown him, but for the fistfuls of its mane he clutched. Horse and rider spun in place on the far side of the bridge, disoriented. The horseman behind Jason laughed. A terrible, deep, cracking sound from all directions, like a thousand axes chopping down the woods. 
Jason felt searing heat as a ball of flame whipped over his shoulder. A burning jack-o'-lantern arced across the bridge. Its maniacal face spun end over end. It grinned back at Jason for an instant, spun around and crashed into Ichabod's temple, knocking him from his horse and into the dust. The pumpkin careened upwards, exploding against the trees, shooting tendrils of flame up their trunks, igniting branches and showering the world with sparks and flaming leaves. Jason recoiled, fell to his knees, and threw his arms over his face. His lungs and heart pumped wildly. They slowed. He brought his arms down. The bridge was broken again. It was over. <laughs>